When we were kids, Dad would tell us about the wuss, the milk wild man of the woods. They were stories that Babu had told him. Jimmy's favorite was the one where these two trappers go up into the mountains near Monkey Beach. At one point, they had to separate because the trail split. They put a Y-shaped stick at the crossroads, and the trapper who finished his line first would point the stick in the direction of their camp. The first guy who finished checking the traps heard something big moving in the bushes ahead of him. He caught a glimpse of light brown fur through the leaves and thought it was a grizzly. Keeping his gun pointed in the direction of the shaking bushes, he left the trail, moving backwards as quickly and quietly as he could, thinking that if he stayed downwind, it wouldn't notice him. So he wasn't paying attention to what was behind him when he broke into a clearing. He heard a grunt. He spun around. And in front of him were more than 20 very hairy men. They looked as surprised as he was, they were tall, with thick brown hair on their chests, arms, and legs. Their heads were shaped oddly, very large, and slanted back sharply from the brow. One of them growled and started towards him. He panicked and bolted back into the bushes, and they began to chase him. And they were fast. He was quickly cornered at the foot of a cliff. He climbed up. They gathered at the bottom in a semicircle and roared. When they followed him up, he raised his gun and knowing he'd probably have only one shot, picked the leader. The trapper shot him in the head, and the creature landed with a heavy thump at the bottom of the cliff. As the other Sasquatches let out howls of grief, the trapper ran. After he reached the beach and realized that no one was following him, he made his way back to the camp. His partner wasn't there. The sun was setting, and the trapper knew that he was going to have to wait till the morning before he could go after him. He broke camp, put all the stuff into their boat, anchored out into the bay, and spent the night wide awake. At first light, he headed up the mountain. When he got to the crossroads, he saw his partner, <clears throat> battered, bloody, and most definitely dead. Before he could get to them, the howling started all around, and he turned and ran. Robinson's debut novel, Monkey Beach, is by far the most appropriate book for Trent Reeves' 2011. Already a celebrated author in the Trent community, Robinson's compelling piece of literature, set in the Canadian landscape, introduces the readers to characters who are so vivid in their portrayal that their stories read as stunningly honest autobiographies instead of clever works of fiction. Robinson contrasts the struggles of her main character, Lisa, next to the triumphs of her younger brother, Jimmy, as they grow up together in a close-knit Hydra community in the village of Kitimat, located in northern British Columbia. The landscape is the hook for the novel, grabbing the reader's attention from the beginning. Robinson's descriptions convey the grace and savagery of the land in a way that is on par with the beautiful paintings done by Emily Carr, a woman who also tried to capture the aspects of spirituality from the surrounding countryside. Robinson's most compelling illustrations move back and forth between the ocean and the forest, both of which Lisa feels an unspeakable connection with. Lisa describes her dreams of the ocean in the opening pages of the novel. For the last week, I have been dreaming about the ocean, lapping softly against the hull of the boat, hissing as it rolls gravel up the beach, ocean swells hammering the shore, lifting the rocks in an ethereal spray before the waves make a grumble and retreat. It is important for the book that is chosen for trend reads to speak to first-year students, to capture their interests and make them want to talk about it. Robinson's main character, Lisa, is 18 throughout the majority of the novel and her struggles to face her future and grow up speak to the first-year students who are stepping out on their own for the first time. However, at Trent and Oshawa, many first-year students are mature students and well past that initial stage of discovering their independence. Monkey Beach speaks to them as well through the stories of the older generations, Lisa's parents, older cousins, aunts, uncles, and grandparents. Their stories allow every reader to connect with something, whether it's falling in love, losing a love, growing apart, or just growing up. The conflicts and relationships between the generations speak to everyone, from the rebellious teens who felt they were unfairly punished by their parents, to the parents who desperately want more for the children they love. This book, as Stephen Horner mentions in his nomination video, speaks deeply to what Trent as a university and as a community is all about. It is a story that speaks to how the Canadian landscape can shape the community's identity, how it shapes all of our identities. 
Here at Trent, we are known for our Indigenous Studies program, and this book provides insight into the specific world of Haisla spirituality. Robinson's subtle movement from the present to the spiritual world is flawless and creates an impressive balance in the story. In addition to an Indigenous Studies students, Monkey Beach will speak in a powerful voice to students ranging in discipline from English to history to psychology and beyond. Everyone is interested in family, and that means all of us will be moved by Monkey Beach. Most importantly, this novel is exactly the kind of book that students will encounter throughout their years at Trent. Robinson's narration encourages active reading and reflection as she slowly brings together her characters and the pieces of their lives fall into place. Even more importantly, Monkey Beach will encourage passionate discussion about the tragic secrets that are hidden in the characters' past. Much of Canada's dark history is brought to light in this Canadian Gothic novel. Thank you. Thank you.